Okay, well, this is always a highlight for the conference, um, being able to, to, to talk with our, you know, adults with cystinosis. They're the real experts um, on this condition, and, and it, it's always great to hear from them, to be inspired by them, and to have, you know, they're, they're very candid and, and kind to answer all of our questions. And so, we'll, we'll start it off. Um, you know, there's a lot of you up here, but I think we should probably just have you quickly introduce yourselves, like, you know, less than 10 seconds, and then we'll jump in with some questions. How does that sound? And so I'll, I'll pass off my mic to you, Brian, and we can just go down. And uh, we got a mic down here with Max, so we can just share the mics. So hello, everybody. My name's Brian. Field questions. I'm 43, doing good. Uh, this is probably my, I'm going to guess about my 10th conference. Hi, I am Alex. I'm 36. I am married to Brian. Um, and this is probably my eighth conference. Hi, my name is Heather. Um, I'm 33 years old. I'm from Canada, um, BC. And I've been to a handful of conferences so far. My name is Brandon. Made up some time right there. I'm Tyler. I have cystinosis. <laughs> My name is Jacob. This is my, I think, my second or third one I've, I've been at. Uh, I'm from Washington. I'm Jordan. I'm from Canada. Uh, I think this is like my fourth or fifth conference, um, and I'm 25. I'm Tina, and I'm from Washington. I'm 20 years old, and this is probably like my 19th conference, 18th. <clears throat> uh, I'm Kurt. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm 31 years old, and this is... Went to a lot of them as a child, so I don't remember all of them, but uh, this is my uh, third year in a row from being back, so. Hi, I'm Jeffrey, I'm from France. I'm 28, and I've been doing the conferences for, I think, 20 years, both in Europe and uh, the US. I'm Mac, I'm 60, I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and I've been going to conferences since 99. Okay, does anyone have a burning question that they'd like to start with for our panelists? What do you do for work? Or do you have hobbies or stuff like that? Let's see. Uh, I work for like a lawnmower parts company. I have a degree in horticulture. I don't work as much right now because we have two kids and I take one of them to school. That keeps me pretty busy. I work as a preschool teacher slash director um, part-time. Uh, I went to school for a medical administration and I've never worked doing that, um, just so, yeah. Um, I'm an LPN um, and I work in a long-term seniors care home. I'm a police officer. Uh, I am a sports motion designer. I do animation for anything you've seen on TV or social media or at a sporting event? Uh, I work at the Naval Shipyard over where I live, um, and I love to go camping. Uh, I'm Jordan. I actually just recently switched jobs. I'm kind of doing construction right now. It's kind of just a job for now, so trying to figure out my life. Um, and my hobby is like cooking and that kind of thing. So. Um, I'm a full-time sophomore year at college student going to school for sonography, for ultrasound, and for pediatrics is the goal. And I also work 20 plus hours a week just uh, doing retail. Um, I've actually been off for like six months, but uh, enjoying my time off. Uh, but I'll be starting back to work in a couple of weeks in a new job in Texas, uh, which I'm really excited about. I'm a certified clinical CMA. So it's all back office. I, uh, I do a lot of shots mostly, um, lots of injections, but I do kind of everything that you would see in a doctor's office in the back, so. I've done a formation a while back to, be, to do IT. So I did IT for a while, but uh, right now I'm not working and I'm doing uh, streaming on the side. I've been retired for two years. I worked in IT for 35 years.
So we saw in uh, Hank's presentation the importance of having a mentor, people to look forward and look ahead. And uh, Tina, you didn't ask to be a mentor. It just kind of happened. I, I, it's an open-ended question of what do you think is a way that you can grasp a hold as people have gone through what you have to the younger folks and actually, or instruct to how to become mentors because it's clear that it's very important, especially for even for parents to see that their kids have someone to look ahead of, not, not just the parents themselves. Uh, that's a pretty tough question, especially since I'm French, I don't quite get the, all the implications. But I think it's, uh, it just happens when uh, you come to this conference that naturally you, you, you gravitate towards um, parents that have que questions and sometimes um, anxieties about uh, what if my kid doesn't fit right in the school or something. And you can give out advice to them uh, uh, on how you did it yourself. So I think uh, organically, you take kind of this role of uh, mentor. Yeah, I think it's, um, well, that was loud. Um, I think it's really important to have somebody you can look up to, especially, and uh, um, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a kid, especially, and you're kind of dealing with all the emotions of having a uh, disorder like this, and you're different from all your school friends, and. You know, you might tell your school friends about what you're going through, but they're not going to really understand it. Like, no one really ever understands it. So, especially helpful to have an older an adult, I think, to look up to. Who's like, they're successful, they work, they might even live by themselves, you know, and they take care of themselves. And they, it's, it's nice to see that. Because I think a lot of the times, especially, you know, when you're, when, like, for all of you parents out there, you were probably told, you know, your child was going to die at a very early age. And um, when you get past that, and it, it kind of, it's, it's really nice to see like older adults like proof, oh no, I can live a long life and live a healthy and fulfilling life still even though I have to deal with all these things. So I think it's important to see somebody like that who's older than you. Um, I think, yeah, like you said, being a mentor, I mean, I don't think of myself as a mentor because I'm not. Like me and Henry are just best friends. He's taught me a lot more. Just, I mean, I feel like he's helped me throughout the past year. It's been really rough with my health and everything and he's been there for me more. Um, but I think, too, it helps having people like who have similar challenges. Like Kurt, I'll text, him a text message if I'm in the ER, I'll be like, hey, is this okay to use? Or hey, what was your experience with this? And it's great having that life experience from someone else who's experienced it, or just having those connections. And I think it also it's like, it gives you a passion, too. I feel like a lot of people in the world, like even you go to college, people don't know what they do half the time. But for me, I knew exactly. I've always wanted to work in a children's hospital. You know, you feel like you have a passion from that. And I think it gives you a, like, a more better look on life, like, oh, this is kind of aside from the point of what we were talking about, but like, just a more, you appreciate life more and you really just, I don't know. I think these, these conferences and, and meetups are one of the best things. I remember meeting Mac like 20 years ago at a, like a town hall or something. And, you know, he was my age now basically. And it was like, how is this person, you know, 30, 40 years old? Like, that's crazy. I'm, you know, I'm in high school and I'm not thinking about, you know, past college right now. And this guy's working and doing all this stuff. And it's, it's really cool now that we have this many adults, you know, just here, not even in general. There's a ton of adults out there that these kids have to look up to. And I don't think it's necessarily a straight up mentorship as it is just being able to look at someone and seeing that, you know, there is hope and there is, you know, a future. And, we have, you know, married couples and kids and, and stuff that was not something you necessarily saw, you know, 20 years ago. Um, I would say those kind of connections, um, like everyone else said, already happen here, but also going to places like um, uh, camp. Um, I saw uh, you guys had a camp um, this last summer. Um, I did that kind of similar thing when I was in elementary, called it kidney camp. Um, and I don't know if I enjoyed it as much as a kid at the time. I kind of knew it would happen every year. But I know for my mother, she especially enjoyed it as the break. Yeah. Um, <laughs> every July, first week of July. Um, and to, when I look back, like as an adult now myself, I have formed those friends now that I still keep in contact with. So 
Um, and it's just good to relate to other kids, especially like at camp somewhere you normally can't fit in. Like everyone lines up and all the nurses give everyone their pills and get to, you know, swap stories. And like, it's just a lot of fun. Um, the doctors used to come to um, the camp and we'd push them in the pool as like payback. And it was, it was just a really great time. So yeah, <laughs> highly recommend if you have the chance to send your kid to a camp that they can fit in with. Yeah. So um, you're adults, some of you have children yourselves, um, so we've got, and some of you are the same age, if not older than some of the parents that are out in the audience that have little ones. So what would you suggest as your, your adult self and your, as a parent, advice that you might offer to the uh, younger parents that have just had a diagnosis for their kid? So I'm 43, and I never imagined to have any kids. Uh, we're blessed to adopt one, pretty soon get another. Uh, my advice, I have my faith, my family, good support system. My advice, like my dad always taught me, I know it's rough. You go through so much. But I was always taught to, even with the hardest stuff, have a sense of humor and be positive. That's what's got me through. I think that's very important. Um, I will mimic what he's saying. And then also, like, growing up, we never, or not we, but my family never defined me as, like, cystinosis child. Um, I have an older brother, and then I have two half-siblings. And so I was just a sibling, or I, like, it just wasn't, we never used cystinosis as a crutch for why I couldn't do sports or why I couldn't do whatever I wanted to do. Like even like I'm not athletically coordinated, but my mom was like, if you want to try a sport, by all means, try it. Um, even after transplant, of course, there was still like stipulations of what I couldn't do in like gym and stuff like that. But I still tried. Um, and so I think just it's important to not tell them, oh, you can't do this because you have cystinosis. Like, letting them fail because I think even if you have a child that doesn't have cystinosis or any other medical condition, as parents, like, I still want both of our boys to try, even if in my heart I'm like, boy, you can't do that, but go ahead and try, you know? Um, but I just think that's important, too. Um, just real quick, I would say... Uh just understanding probably from a young age that um, like your parents are your advocate when you're younger, but as you grow older, then you're your best advocate. So um, for things that like not everyone can help you with all the time, just making sure you take your meds on time and you know just keeping on top of things like doctor's appointments, you gotta keep on top of that yourself. <laughs> I forgot the question, but... Um, what would you tell young parents, Brandon? Um, I would say, let, I mean, this might sound weird, but let your ki kids fail, because if you don't fail, you won't succeed. Um, I think it's important to go through hard things in life, whatever it might be, because it makes you stronger. Um, don't treat them different. Um, my, my two children don't have cystinosis, obviously, but they have other things they deal with. Um, and just, just let them strive and, and try, like I said, try, because you want them to try at some things, and maybe they'll fail and try at something else and be successful. So just let them keep on putting one, in front of, one foot in front of the other and you know, keep pushing, keep moving. That's what's most important. Yeah, to, to add to that, I know this goes against every instinct that you have as systems as parents, but don't be a helicopter parent for life. I think the sooner you can teach your kids to dose out their own medicine and do their refills, and I know Stephen can probably talk more about that as his kids seem to be really doing a lot now, and it's kind of cool seeing over the last six or seven years how Sam and Lars have really started to, to come in their own and do, do a lot of this stuff. I know there have been parents in the past that said their you know, 14, 15 year olds are calling for you know, doctor's appointments and follow-ups and talking to the pharmacy. And I think, you know, not being, doing everything, you want to do everything. Obviously, when they're young, you have to do everything. But I think the sooner you can let some of that go, um, the better. And I would say also, as they said, lean on the support system. You don't have to do everything yourself. Take time for yourself. 
Um, I know, you know, with two young kids that don't have cystinosis, it's crazy enough, so I can't imagine having even one with cystinosis, but I know everyone has at least a little bit of a community or a family near you, and just, you know, lean on that and don't feel like you're a burden because letting, you know, a grandparent take the kids for a weekend is not going to kill them. Um, that's kind of one of the things I've seen over the last 15, 20 years is parents get a little more lenient, and, and I think that's huge, especially as they get into an adult age. I mean, I don't have any kids, but growing up, uh, my mom, she was amazing. Uh, she wasn't here this weekend, but uh, she wishes she was for the son. Uh, but one thing sh I think both my parents did really well was teach me that, yeah, today, you know, sometimes you'll have your uh, downs and then ups, uh, but there's always something to look forward to. Um, and, you know, uh, they, I mean, they taught me to, uh, well, my mom always used a uh, quote from Einstein. I don't remember it right now, but I know it um, along the line of, you know, uh, oh, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, E equals MC, no. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it, it was along the lines of, like, you know, don't think about uh, yesterday, um, live for today and hope for tomorrow. Um, but she she really was a uh, driving force and got me to understand, like, it is very important to take my medicine. Like, of course, she said, the one, one, she said, you can complain about normal things, about being a kid, like taking out trash, doing chores, um, doing homework you don't want to. But the one thing that is going to be constant in my life is taking my medicine and how important that is for my health. And I think that's one thing that just really pushed me forward and kept me uh, how healthy I am today. Yeah, um, I just want to say, like, in the last, I guess, five years, I've kind of realized that, uh, like, family's forever and they'll always be there if you're, you know, down or not feeling good. And I've noticed in the last few years that friends will be there when you're happy and partying, but then when you're not feeling good or down, they won't be there. So I think this for like the kids out there, just remember that even though your parents are hard on you, that family is forever, so. Um, going back to what Alex and Brandon were saying, I think that's really important just to try, you know, like don't limit yourself, you know. Um, like when I had my kidney transplant two months after I joined the track and field team and I was terrible at running, but I had the best time. I made, you know, it was fun. Um, and I was great, but you know, you try things. And even right now, my schooling is so hard. Like I'm take, I just retook another class, and I probably have to retake it a third time. But I'm like, every time I get a better grade, but I need to get like top of the line grades to get into the program I'm taking. So yeah, it's gonna take me maybe a little bit longer, but you know, just keep trying, and you'll get there, and you work hard for it, and it'll be worth it. Yeah, my <coughs> excuse me, my parents. Um, the, the second. Uh, from, um, this is second hand from my mother information I'm giving you, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, so when I, when I was first diagnosed, my mom and my dad did everything they could to understand stenosis. And then when I started getting a little older, they started to really make sure I knew. I remember going to doctor's appointments all the time as a kid, and I would know more about like, my disease and labs and what things should be. And the doctors and nurse like, wow, you, you should be a doctor. You know, you've just learned all this through... And, and I would tell them, oh, it's all by, like, osmosis, you know, and so, um, and that kind of probably would inspire me to get in the medical field in the first place. Uh, but, yeah, I just got to, parents, like, uh, I was really lucky. I didn't have two, well, well, I didn't have two bad helicopter parents, but, you know, your kids, when your kids are in school and, you know, you have to rely on them to, like, you have to go, you know, go to the nurse, take your medication, you know, it is a responsibility, and um, you got to, and you really, you really want to, you really want to um, have your kids really be self-reliant and be their own advocate. It's a lot easier nowadays to be your own advocate uh, going to doctor's points because now you can, you know, we have stuff we can go online, we can see our results, and no, we, don't have to, we don't have to rely on the doctor or the doctor's um, nurses or anyone like that to tell us. And, you know, doc, uh, medical system especially today, is, it's, it's crazy, and it's, it's really hectic, and it's hard to get a hold of anyone, you know. You send a message, you're lucky if you get a response back in, like, a few days or a week, and... Um, it's, it's really important for your own child to be their advocate because, you know, doctors, you know, they see 
hundreds of patients, if not thousands, and um, they, the things slip through the cracks, and then, you know, your doctor's not always going to, uh, unfortunately, not going to be, like, right on your beck and call constantly, especially doctors who are not your system knows it's doctor. They're just regular doctors, and they deal with tons of patients, and they can't afford to spend time on one patient, so things fall through the cracks, and it's really important to just be your own advocate and ask questions. Like, I think that was the thing that took me the longest to learn is to really always ask questions, whether you think it's not a big deal or not, always tell them how you're feeling, and, um, you know, I think as systematics, uh, especially as, like, when you're a teenager, you tend to hide things from your parents, not, like, not, like, purposely, but, like, hide how you're feeling, like, and to you, it's just normal, but you could be sick, and, you know, you go in the doctor, like, oh, yeah, I've felt this for, like, a month, and you're like, oh, why didn't you come back a month ago? It's just because you're used to feeling, you're not used to feeling good. You're, you're feeling bad as you're normal, you know, but, and then the last thing is just, you know, for parents, uh, you know, just have patience, because, you know, you're, when your kids go to adult, they're not going to be perfect right away. I, will, I certainly was not. It took me a couple of years after uh, I started looking after my own meds, making my own appointments that it took me some time to really get a rhythm down. And you just got to be patient. You know, we're not, nobody's perfect. Um, and then give yourself patience, you know. Don't think that because you didn't do something, you failed your child or you didn't say something, this could have happened. Just you have to give your own self patience. And I know that parents can get real stressed out. And it's important to, like, remind yourself that just to have patience and to hope for the best. So. And then we'll go, if it's okay, we'll go. Through. Yeah. Sure, I think it's going to build on what we're already kind of talking about, and, and hopefully it's not too redundant, but uh, we we're talking about helicopter parents, and of course, w we know that label, but we're trying to be the best advocates for our children as much as possible. Um, maybe you can give, or a few of you can give some examples of where you've become your own advocate and where you may have failed and where maybe you have succeeded, so that as we are talking with some of the teenagers that are getting ready to transition, uh, that we can maybe just have some open conversations about that. Go for it, Matt. So then first, I'm going to answer the first question. Was I was fortunate to have two great parents. Uh, my mother taught me confidence. There's any time I was having, uh, if I didn't have confidence, she she let me know I could do anything I put my mind to. And, and then my dad taught me the value of hard work. He was born in 1930, so he was old school. I mowed, I helped neighbor haul hay when I was 18. Just, so you know, he, he taught me to work, and I've always been self-motivated. And back to the, to the meds question, I had my transplant at age 11. <clears throat> my mother said, well, you got to do this the rest of your life. Start doing it now. So, I knew about you know, insurance, man. I, I, I did everything. So, but I'm 12, 11, 12 years old, and just and that's about it. Uh, okay, to go really quick about the first question, uh, the thing I would say, with uh, all due respect to doctors in the room, is sometimes your doctor doesn't know everything. Sometimes you found out a way that your kid or will tolerate or yourself will tolerate the, the treatment better and the doctor will tell you, oh no, it's not optimal, it's not this or that. The most important, important thing is you find a way to manage it fairly. Uh, aside from that, it's less important. Um, an example of this is uh, after the transplant, doctors told me I could never lift things, I would never, never be able and I slowly over the course of two years built up my strength and now I, I lift up uh, 180 of, of the ground, and uh, I just didn't listen to my doctor. <laughs> it, it turned out well. So j just don't be too focused on protocols and uh, uh, listening exactly to everything you should do, and try to manage how you can. That's my, uh, my best advice. And then, um, are we, um, the first time I had to, uh, truly to speak for myself is um, when I got into, um, I don't know, what is it in the US? I think it's high school, but kids get really mean. And when you smell weird in high school, kids will uh, tell you you don't wash yourself or eat uh, poop or something. And um, I just had to uh, go ahead, take the reins, 
And at the start of the year, I gone in front of the class and explained, okay, um, I take this medication for this reason, and I may smell bad, you can just tell me, and I take a gum or I'll take um, chlorophyll or something to make it go away, and no problem. You don't have to be embarrassed about telling me I smell bad. Because often with kids, it's like um, they not really think what they say, but they, they're embarrassed because you smell bad, because they think it's embarrassing for you. So they try to make jokes and tease you about it. But actually, if you get in front of that and explain to kids even like 14 or something, they are able to understand on some level that you have a condition, a problem, and sometimes you can't help it, you smell bad. Just touch up on that. Um, yeah, with that question, like with the transitioning question, um, I know when I was younger, like uh, say 14, 15, I was kind of transitioning to doing my own medication and stuff. I know with uh, my mom, she, I'd be um, counting on my medication. She'd just kind of sit on the counter on her phone just talking to me while I did it, and she'd kind of help me. And then I got to the point where she'd slowly walk away, go to the living room or something, and then uh, I would have to show her, I guess, my medication. And then it got to the point where she just trusted me. And, and uh, yeah, there was some mess ups where I guess I didn't have all my pills or you know, they'd fall out of my pocket and you'd find them in the couch or something later. And, uh, but overall, you know, sometimes you have to fail, I guess, to realize, yeah, you need to double check or make sure you have all your pills. And, and uh, yeah, it's, the transition part to overall was, it was hard, but it was, it was good. We talked about this a little bit in the adult group, but um, kind of morbid, but kids seeing the process of dialysis, I think would be huge, um, kind of a scared straight sort of thing. But I knew after I got my first kidney, you know, before I had to go on dialysis and I didn't know what it was. It was just like, oh, it's something that keeps you alive. And then once you actually experience like what it is, it, it very much is a scared straight situation where, you know, you're, you're in there with 60, 70 year olds that aren't going to get a kidney that you know, have diabetes that don't care about their body at all. And you're, you know, you're in there three, four days a week. And just even seeing, I think Tina said there's like a video, just seeing a video of what it is would be, would be huge. Um, as a transition, as you get older, like, Hey, you know, if you don't take your medicine, this is what you get. Um, and not everybody is going to get a transplant. Not everybody's that lucky. Um, so that is a little bit extreme, but I, I definitely am a huge proponent of kids knowing what dialysis is and seeing how, horrible it is and maybe understanding how bad you feel during dialysis because it's not like taking your pills and you feel good like dialysis gets you up to a decent level it doesn't keep you at you know a good level um, but that would be my my scared straight advice I, <clears throat> I have to completely agree with him there on Tyler's thing and then to branch off of what Jordan was saying my mom would do the same thing with my medicines and um, just having me be involved with making my doctor appointments and calling in medication. And it really taught <clears throat> me how to be my own advocate. And now being a mom, like it's helped me be an advocate for our boys. Um, like without going into like too much detail, like our oldest son, um, he has his own issues. And so it's helped me learn how to, instead of being told it's going to be oh a year before he's seen. Oh, no, 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 no. I am going to call 800 other places because I'm not waiting a year to help my child. So I think not only being your own advocate, but if your child is, you know, when they become an adult and are going to have their own kids, is it teaches them how to be an advocate for their own children as well. Anyone else? Um, one, one thing when I was a kid, uh, like everyone else here, it's very good to try to ease your child into taking care of themselves and ordering their own things, uh, making up their own medicine for each day. Uh, like when I was younger, I forget what age, um, but like I know my mom tried to transition me pretty young. Uh, like I'd make up medicine for a week, and then uh, my mom would like come double check, make sure everything looked okay, and I did, you know, I messed up a few times, and I was like, oh, you missed this one and this, um, which was really nice. Um, another thing is, uh, like, especially for me, I really had a hard time speaking up for myself. Very shy, um, didn't really want to talk to people, you know. Uh, but one thing I realized really early on is especially in hospitals, if you ever have to go, or doctors, 
Um, sometimes things get mixed up or it's like because they have so many different things going on, you have to speak up and say what it's on your mind. Like I've had, I've had many times where it's like I get medication while I'm in a hospital and it's just completely wrong. Like, and sometimes they just don't have certain things in there and it's like sometimes you're like, hey, uh, this isn't right. And um, like if I just popped it out of my mouth without even looking at it or if I didn't know what, which, what stuff I was taking, um, it might end up bad, you know. Um, so just, it's really, really hard, but try to, as a, as a kid, try to start saying what's on your mind, especially at like doctor's appointments. It, it, I know it's very, very hard sometimes. <laughs> Hi, um, my question is, did any of you guys have a difficult time in school, like kind of middle school, high school, was it really tough and what got you through it? Oh. I guess I'll start out since I have the microphone. Um, yeah, I, I definitely, um, I think it really started in like middle school when, you know, kids are starting to the age where it's like, you know, they see something different with you, they're gonna attack that right away. Um, but especially like uh, getting friends that really don't really care about like, I mean, they care about you, you, you know, but they don't care that you have a rare disease or something's different about you. Um, and then just really just honestly, I mean, not paying attention to what people are saying is a big part because it's like, for me, of course, the smell, we all, we all had that. And it's like, sometimes you gotta try to find ways around that, like chewing gum, of course, um, but I definitely had an easier time in high school compared to middle school. Um, that's pers personally me. Uh, in high school, I, I made some really good friends. One friend I'm actually still, to this day, very, very close with. And I consider him a brother, really. Uh, and you know, it's like they know about what you have, but they obviously want to help you whenever you need help, but they don't constantly bring it up. Like, oh, hey, how's it going? It's like, it's good to hear that I'm doing good, but it's also really nice just to feel normal for, with really close friends. Um, I know when I was in school, um, I had, uh, like I knew what the question was and like I could think about it, but I couldn't like get it on paper. And uh, when I was in school, like I was in like junior high and that kind of thing, I was kind of rebellious, I guess, and I didn't really care about school. And then when I got to, uh, senior high and high school or whatever, I kind of knew I needed to start trying and I got a lot of uh, tutoring, I guess, after school helped me a lot and talking to teachers after class. Um, and I actually, if I needed to do a test, I had like my own separate room kind of thing and where there was like no noise, no distractions and uh, it was definitely easier to do a test and easier to cheat, so that was good. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely one of the good things about it. But yeah, just <laughs> for sure tutoring, that's the main thing. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think just for me, it was mostly high school because, well, I guess eighth grade too, I didn't feel good. My kidneys were failing. And I had my transplant in high school, and then I had my kidney rejection in high school. And then I had like, I was in the hospital for a month again. Um, and then I had a double nephrectomy in high school. So I had like four surgeries or whatever in high school. So I don't even know how I graduated because I missed so much school. I mean, in between that and then skipping classes. But um, I think that um, I honestly, like, I just didn't really care what people thought about me in high school. Not to the extreme point, but like, I just did my own thing. And I made two good friends. I mean, if you're just, you know, there's good people out there and just don't be easily influenced. I don't know. Just don't care what people think. Um, yeah, I was very similar to the situation that Jordan had. You know, I had an IEP all, grow through, all going through elementary through high school, and so I always had extra time for um, tests. I always had, a, like, my own, like, little room I would go to to have tests in a quiet area to have a little extra time. And I didn't necessarily need it all the time, but it was nice to have when I felt like that because I, did, I didn't miss, I really didn't miss a, a lot of school when I got older. I missed a lot of school for, like, elementary school with tons of, surgeries and illness and um, uh, volunteering for a couple of the other uh, trials and things like that and 
Um, I had a really great time in high school, actually. Like, high school was really fun for me because um, my freshman year I had joined uh, the drama department, so I was in, I was always busy. I think, uh, I think like every, like, I think the only semester I wasn't at school from like eight to nine o'clock was uh, my sophomore year when I had broken my arm like in half, um, which that was, that was a lot of fun, so I couldn't really do any kind of active. I couldn't do like the school musical that year because it was just, I had like a full arm cast of some kind. Um, but yeah, I had a really great time in high school. I think the best thing for kids in high school is to join some kind of like extracurricular program because you'll make lifelong friends and the, the core group of five friends I have are all from high school still and uh, I, I, we, I literally have gone to three weddings in the last two years and it's me and my last friend that are down. It's anybody's guess, but with our record, we're probably not gonna be married, so we're in our <laughs> f uh, 40s, if that. <clears throat> so. But yeah, I, th I think it's just really important for them to, to join join something to do after school, keep themselves busy, you know, and because if, if you're around kids that um, are, are, if, how do I don't know how to describe this, if you're around kids that uh, aren't like you and, but you tell them most of the time, uh, they'll, un they're going to understand. I think, I think most people are nicer once they kind of mellow out and then at the end of high school, but, um, but yeah, you know, I, I, had, I had a great time. I really didn't have too many issues. I came back my junior year because my end of my junior year I had my first transplant and I was really skinny and I came back and I had gained like 20 pounds of just mass, you know, so I looked like a whole completely different person. I'd gotten my braces off, you know, so senior year was pretty good for me. <laughs> uh, at first I got uh, really lucky because I, I had the same friend group from a very young age to like 14 or something. And then I changed school and I lost my original group of friends and I got with a new crew, I think, uh, who weren't nice people and dropped me before because I, uh, I smelled bad and I, they didn't like me. So I had a rough year after that, especially since I did the um, trial for Process B at the same time. So I had a hard time with the smell and uh, vomiting a lot. and. So I spent, a, I spent a year alone, but then I joined a, an art class, like I wanted to do a design. And in, the, in this art class, I found all sorts of uh, weird people <laughs> where I fit exactly in, because everyone had its little uh, quirk or health thing. I don't know if it's what the school or just, uh, just luck, but uh, everyone kind of um, understood having a special uh, condition you had to take care of. So from, uh, from 17 onwards, it got easier, really easier. But yeah, that's, there's a tough spot in between uh, yeah, 14, 17. It's uh, hard for some people. I really didn't have any, can you hear me? Yeah. I really didn't have any problems during school. And the last part of fifth grade, I kind of went in kidney failure and three weeks in May, 1st of June. I was on dialysis for three weeks. Had my kidney on June 10th. Then I was back in sixth grade, back to school in September and lived in the same place, so lots of friends, everybody knew me. And then college, no, no issues either. Only issue in college was maybe the first semester, there's these things called frat parties. So, um, but then once I kind of adjusted and, and knew how to study more and got back on track and got out in four years and all was good. Good. All right, well, thank you, everyone, uh, for participating in this panel. I think before we let you off the stage, uh, it is somebody's birthday, I believe. Is it, is it tomorrow, Mac, or Tuesday? But we're going to sing happy birthday to you, if that's all right. <laughs> This is, this is a big 6-0, so, so uh, don't listen to me because I'll sing off tune, but let's, let's, uh, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Mac, happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you.
but yeah, thank, thank you again to all our panelists for being open and honest and, and sharing um, that, that great advice with all of us. I'm, I think we'd all like to probably sit here and ask you questions for another hour, but we are setting up lunch, so we should probably keep moving. So thank you, you're, you're welcome to, to join the audience again. We'll wrap things up here. If I could have the conference co-chairs come up. Okay, well, I think it's been a pretty amazing few days uh, together. Um, I know I, I feel rejuvenated. That's, that's why we come to this conference. You know, I, I was, we were talking earlier in one of the breakouts that, you know, most of the year we kind of forget about cystinosis. I mean, it's always there. You can't really forget about it. You got your med schedule, but it just becomes your normal life, your normal routine. And it, it's great to come here and to be with all of you to get a really healthy dose of cystinosis um, and, and to really remember you know, what it is we're all going through together, to, to, to get that hope and inspiration from what all of our scientists and researchers are, are working on. I think this was a great, a great year to, to hear more about some exciting new potential um, therapies that are coming down the pipeline. I think we all hope and pray that the stem cell transplant will be, will be the cure, will be available to everyone but we know that we need to keep looking for other ways to, to make life better and easier for, for all of us. So, so I'm very grateful uh, to all of you, grateful to the Stack family. Thank you so much uh, for, for helping put on this conference. Thank you to, to my co-chairs. I feel like a little bit like calling myself a co-chair is stolen valor because these guys did a lot more work than I did uh, putting this conference together. So I want to give them a, a round of applause. Thank you.